11 o'clock and we just reached quorum, although there are a few members still not present. All right. All right, well, um, maybe we'll get this show on the road then. Um, I guess I would uh, call the meeting to order and we'll immediately take roll so we can establish a quorum and then we'll get on from there. So uh, I'm going to call out names and if you're here, just respond with here or I or whatever, and then we'll get going. So Christina Gentry. Ah, oh, there we go. Here. <laughs> Rebecca Buford. Here. Dana Ortiz. Here. Edith Guppy. Here. Thomas Howe. Present. Ron Gacious. Not here yet. Erica Zimmerman. Here. Sarah Waters. Here. Shannon Ori. Don't see her yet. Thomas Allen. Here. Oh. Here. Okay, Thomas, thank you. Shannon Reed. Not here. Monte Soka here. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nine, so I think we've established a quorum. Um, Leah, if you would want to start off with the public comment about the meeting or the, pub, the general thing we read on our Zoom meetings, and then we'll jump in from there. And thank you everybody for joining us today. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Leah Roseland, Affordable Housing Administrator. I'm gonna provide a few procedural reminders for this vir virtual meeting. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the city's YouTube channel and public access cable channel 25. During the meeting, when you're not participating, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon found in the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu next to the video icon. When you're muted, a red line will appear over the icon. Muting your microphone during the meeting will make it easier for everyone to hear. You'll just have to remember to unmute if and when you want to speak. In some cases, I may mute or unmute people as needed to minimize distractions during the meeting. Please remember to state your near name every time you speak for the benefit of those listening remotely. You can turn your video camera on or off by clicking the video icon in the menu. For the purposes of this public meeting, when you are participating in the meeting, please keep your video on. When you are not participating in the meeting, it's okay to turn your video off. You will still be able to listen when your video is off. You'll just have to remember to turn your video back on when you are participating. Turning your video off when you're not participating will help make sure that the active meeting participants can be seen on screen. In some cases, I may turn someone's video off if they are not actively participating to avoid distraction during the meeting. You can always turn your video back on during the meeting. If you're participating by phone, you can click star six to unmute your phone. For those using Zoom, somewhere on your screen, you will see a choice to toggle between speaker and gallery view. Speaker view shows the active speaker. Gallery view tiles all the meeting participants. Board members and city staff members, you must state your name and title each time you speak. All motions will be need will need to be stated clearly. After a motion is made and seconded, the chair will call on board members individually to provide their vote. Mr. Chair, you will then need to announce whether the motion carried and the count of the vote. When public comment is sought on an item, individuals participating via Zoom should use the raise your hand feature. Windows and Mac users can access this feature through the participants button at the bottom of their screen. Android and iPhone users can access this feature through the more button located at the bottom right hand corner of their screen. For those calling in by phone, you may dial star six. Individuals will be called upon by name in the order they appear on the meeting host screen. When you're called on, please unmute your listening device and state your name before speaking. The chair will then call for in-person public comment for those without access to technology options. Staff present will direct you to the podium to speak following social distancing and safety protocols. The regular three-minute time limit will apply. Thank you.
Maybe I'll try unmuting. This is Monty Soka chair. Uh, with that announcement and the meeting call to order, we will open it to public comments. So is there anyone uh, here that would like to make a public comment? Okay, I am not seeing anyone raise their hand on the screen. With that, is there anyone in the comp in the uh, chamber? This is Leah Roseland, Affordable Housing Administrator. There's nobody present in person for public comment today. Okay, last call for public comment. Okay, I am going to close public comment and we will move on to item B on the agenda, approving the minutes from January 10, 2022. Um, I would entertain a motion to uh, approve those minutes. So moved, Thomas Howe, Lawrence Porter, Realtors Representative. Thank you, Thomas. Oh, there's a second. Rebecca Buford, Tenants to Homeowners, second. Okay. Thank you. So we have a motion on the floor and it's been seconded. Is there any discussion of the minutes? Any edits? Seeing none, I close that discussion period and we will. I will call the roll. I'm going to call the roll in the same order that I called it uh, to take roll. So, and if we have another vote, it'll be the same thing. So just take note of who you're after. So, uh, Christina Gentry. Um, I'm going to recuse. I was not present. Okay. Uh, Rebecca Buford. Approve. Dana Ortiz. Approve. Edith Guppy. Uh. Thomas Howe. Yes. Erica Zimmerman. Approve. Sarah Waters. Approve. Thomas Allen. Approve. Monty Soka. Approve. That is one, two, three, four. Eight, four, one abstention. Uh, motion passes. We approve the minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, Moving on to C in the agenda items, we will receive the monthly financial report. Who's that? This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. We collected 91,000 in Affordable Housing Trust Fund sales tax in January, 2022. There's no change on the expense side and we anticipate meeting budgeted revenue. Um, we have um, about 811,000 in balance. Monty Sokup Chair, thank you, Leah. Um, I have a couple questions. Is the 91,000 kind of in line with what our projections were? Or is that above or below what we typically see in a month? Because that'd be the November collection, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, right? This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. It is a little bit more than was collected in November, um, just by about 10,000 more. Um, so we'll likely have to follow the rest of the year before we get a trend for 2022, but it's more or less in line with the budgeted revenue. Okay. And the 811,000, is that our balance, our uncommitted balance? That's correct. So. Okay. Yeah, so that's okay. deducting the 2022 allocations that were made, but not expended yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, the second item on the agenda here is tennis to homeowners affordable housing trust fund request. Um, it's the Tennis of Homeowners 1718 Harper proposal. Um, as you would obviously note, this is kind of out of sequence. Uh, and other than saying that, I think I will turn it over to uh, Rebecca or Nicholas, whoever is presenting on behalf of Tennis to Homeowners. Thank you, Monty. I will assume that I need to recuse myself and Nicholas will be presenting as as we usually do with applications. So I will recuse myself from this point and then keep track on YouTube and return after this discussion. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, okay. This is uh, Nicholas Ward with Tenants to Homeowners. And I'm just gonna give a quick um, overview here real quick of what's, what's going on with this proposal. Um, so this is a request from Tenants to Homeowners Inc. for $200,000 of funding from the City of Lawrence Housing Trust Fund. As Monty mentioned, this is an out of cycle request and um, it leverages a unique affordability uh, opportunity that was not available during the regular housing trust fund cycle, which is why we're bringing it now. The property at 1718 Harper is currently zoned RS7. The RS7 zoning distinction typically indicates lots of seven to 10,000 square feet. While this is often the case, Lawrence's zoning districts have created numerous outlier exceptions. At 38,445 square feet, 1718 Harper is one of these exceptions. The unusually large size of this lot permits for a subdivided replat with a total of four RS7 lots, with each new lot ranging in size from seven to 10,000 square feet. Utilizing the affordable housing density bonus, um, a total of eight units would be permitted at this site, two units per RS7 lot. For this to work, the project would require a variance allowing the back two lots to exist without frontage and to receive their access via a shared drive. This model has a precedent uh, from 2012 to tenants to homeowners development at 818, 822, 826, and 830 Elm in North Lawrence. 1718 Harper expands on the Elm precedent by making use of the affordable housing density bonus, permitting the two units by right on lots zoned RS7. In addition to the lot, there's also an existing unit at 1718 Harper. This two bedroom, one bathroom home has recently received basic improvements, including a new roof, windows, siding, and gutters. Uh, the unit will require some additional interior rehab. We're estimating at around $10,000. Once rehabilitated, the home would then be offered as an ownership unit and trust at 30 to 50,000 below market value, or as a deeply subsidized rental unit. To fully leverage the affordability potential of this property, tenants to homeowners is seeking a variance that would permit a shared drive to serve the proposed seven units. The variance would permit the rear lots to exist without frontage as precedented in the properties at 818, 822, 826, and 830 Elm. TTH is requesting a recommendation for $200,000 of housing trust fund funding for acquisition of 1718 Harper. This funding would be leveraged to create seven new units of permanently affordable infill single family housing within 24 months of allocation. And then uh, Leah, real quick, I was gonna see, would I be able to screen share a few things? This is Leah Roseland, Affordable Housing Administrator. Absolutely, let me turn that on for you right now. And just let me know when, when everyone's able to see. You should be able to start sharing screen now. Okay. And Monty, are you able to see my screen right now? I do not see your screen. Okay, real quick. Let me just take a second here. Okay, Leah, do you have access to the PDF that I sent along right now? This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Yeah, absolutely. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, let's see. Nicholas, if you just want to let me know what particular page you'd like up on the screen. So we'll just start with the second page. Perfect. Okay, so we'll start here. Um, so what you can see... Um, there's the section here, you can see where the 1718 address is listed here. And so um, there, there's a larger um, kind of section that's outlined here in the neighborhood. Um, 
but from just below 1718, there's that little red shed, and then it goes um, all the way to the right. You can kind of see this uh, subtle boundary that's a darker color. So that entire lot there is the 38,445 square feet. And up to the top left of that, you see there's a small house. That's the existing uh, house that's on that property that I mentioned had received those repairs. And so um, the, with the variance that we're seeking would allow a drive where that um, existing white driveway is in the 1718 lot uh, to come up the center and then this lot would be split evenly into four RS7 lots and all, ex all three of the quadrants aside from the one that currently has the house on it would have two small houses. So if, Leah, if you can go to the next slide. And so here you see um, one version of that. We worked with our architect to come up with uh, two different versions of what this could look like. And this is the version that allows for um, six additional units, so a total of seven. And you can see the homes that we're uh, proposing here are smaller units. They're 528 square feet, so a very small home with a single bedroom and a shared kitchen. Um, dining room space. It has a small carport versus a full garage and then a covered front porch. And so each of these lots as divided, I think comes up to a little bit more than 9,000 square feet. So we're almost looking at four RS10 lots in terms of the actual size, though the distinction technically through zoning would still be RS7. And this allows us with kind of the um, a minimum amount of paving that we're able to do while still adhering to all necessary setbacks. So not requiring any additional variances except for the, the shared drive and the no frontage on this back lot here. Uh, Leah, if you can go to the next one. And then this is another version, which kind of mirrors what we recently saw from TTH's 2021 uh, proposal for Michigan 6. Um, as you can see in this one, it becomes very evident that we're not utilizing the back third of these lots. Um, and so to more adequately and responsibly utilize the space that's there, we're, we're looking at proposing the, the, the previous one. It gives us one additional house um, and it also uses the space a little bit better uh, while still making those RS7 lots around 9,000 square feet. Um, Leah, if you can go to the next slide. And this one may be, yeah, there we go. And this is just a quick um, rendering uh, by Mike Myers at Hernley. This is the 528 uh, square foot house. As you can see, it's just a very uh, simple a uh, gabled house with a little front porch and then uh, the carport component, um, which in this version is a, a little small. These are just a quick rendering. So I believe that there's a gabled option and then kind of the newer modern, just like single slant roof option, but both with the same layout and the same square footage. And then Leah, if you could go to the next slide. And then this is just um, a quick look at what the floor plan would look like on a house that's 700 or sorry, 528 square feet. So you can see the size and um, kind of the organization of all these spaces for the, the nine by 11 bedroom, 12 by 12 living room, the kitchen, how the kitchen has the island that splits between the two, um, access to the attic, and then the bathroom with hosting the washer and dryer and all of that. And so these were really proposing these smaller units um, for one reason to really respond to what's put forth in the 2018 uh, housing analysis that's looking at seniors uh, becoming one of our largest populations. And then also just thinking about um, the significant need for um, single parent families. So um, a single individual or someone with a kid. And um, this is responding uh, to that. So um, these, are, these are the houses we're proposing for that space. And then that initial layout with the seven units is what we're proposing as well. Um, I did send this along to Mary Miller at planning last week. 
And this was kind of um, a quick move because the house just came onto the market. So we didn't have a lot of time to um, realize this opportunity and then go through all the, the following steps. But I was able to get all of this put together, get a hold of Mary Miller. And she ran this by uh, fire code. She ran this by some other folks in planning. And the response was that the city engineer would prefer the version that has the center drive with the seven units over the one with the three drives and the six units. And that both of those versions would work for fire code. They would just have some additional stipulations for the concrete on that shared drive, which I'm sure is similar to what we did at the property that exists as a precedent over in on Elm Street in North Lawrence. Um, so just a quick presentation there. Um, and of course, this is out of cycle, as I stated, but as we're seeing these opportunities come up and we can't really control when that happens and knowing that there's some funding remaining from this past year, we thought this was a, a really great and a extremely affordable way to bring seven units into existence that weren't previously there and one unit that wouldn't have previously been affordable. So I'll stop there and I'm available for any questions you might have. All right, Samantha, so up here. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, are there questions from the board? Yeah, Tom. Hey, Tom Allen, a member at large. Um, I have two questions. One are, um, you talked about uh, seniors and are all these units uh, handicap accessible? And then um, the, the second question is, because this is a rushed process, will there be, um, let's say we move forward with this, will there be further analysis to um, look at other opportunities to make it even more efficient and maybe even more units? Um, thank you, Nicholas Ward of Tenants to Homeowners. Um, so yes, all of these plans include full turning radiuses, as I understand it, and accessibility. So um, that is 100% a consideration. The I don't think that there is any way without seeking additional variances that we could add more units. Um, the way that we were going about it is kind of a, a soft touch where we're essentially asking for somewhere between one and two variances to make this possible. And then also noting that, that the project uh, in North Lawrence stands as a precedent for the shared use drive and then not having frontage on the back two lots. Um, so I know that realistically, in terms of the square footage, there could be an additional two or three units on this and still meet um, some of the requirements we have, but again, uh, the density bonus is not linked to square footage surrounding a house. It's linked to zoning. And so it's for one additional unit by right for an RS7 lot. And so that's that's kind of what we've gone with here to adhere to the, the what the density bonus currently allows for. And then you had one other question, sorry, that I don't think I answered. I, no, you answered both of them. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Monty Soto Chair, any other questions? This is Christina Gentry, um, former member who is, has or has are still receiving um, subsidies. Um, thank you, Nicholas. I, I, I like also the, the different floor plans as an option. Um, I'm wondering, and I'm curious, I know that you had mentioned um, the, uh, the priority populations and, and, and spoke to um, our aging population, but you also spoke to single families or a, a person who's maybe a single parent with a child. Um, are we looking at some, the different floor plans in the wood bedrooms leaning towards that for single families, assuming that uh, a parent or a caregiver will be staying in the same room with the child? So uh, I'm just kind of wondering if, if we're more, uh, these two floor plans, if there's going to be um, a little bit more discussion about having uh, the two bedrooms is an option, which, which I think is great, but you know, the propositions both look great in their units and their size. Um, but I'm wondering if, you know, if, if we're really, what's the real major focus um, and who the people that you're wanting to stay or what will really population with this priority there um, will be single parent families or will it be um, our aging population or both? Um, so I'm just kind of curious about the single parent floor plan that would have, you know, a mother or caregiver, father um, and a child in one bedroom. So just kind of wanting to see um, if the floor plan with the two bedroom 
um, if that's something that you um, are, are trying to, to really push or is it the one bedroom floor plans that's really more uh, likely to fit into a budget that you see happening immediately? Thank you, Christina. Nicholas Ward with Tenants to Homeowners. Um, in, in what I presented here, we've, um, we've used the single story, one bedroom, 528 square foot uh, footprint house to show for all uh, six of those that would be added to create the seven units. Um, and there, there is some flexibility with what we're allowed in terms of setback and everything else that would allow us to use um, our two bedroom model um, that has a similar footprint. Uh, with that two bedroom model though, it's, it becomes a two story um, dwelling. And so we lose something in full accessibility. It would still be fully visitable but we lose something in full accessibility that we would then gain in a bedroom allowing it to serve another person. And so I think um, our challenge, of course, is not to just kind of build whatever we want, but to be respond to respond to what the need is. And so um, reviewing exactly what that is, and that helps us uh, then decide along with funding um, whether we're building that uh, one bedroom single story unit um, across all of those, or if there's a mix of the two bedroom, two story, and that smaller uh, single bedroom. So thank you for illustrating that. Um, and that's that's a consideration that um, we haven't fully made yet, um, but we know that it's what would be there would be the kind of that footprint size of right around the 528 square feet. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Monty, so up to your other questions. This is Sarah uh, Waters. Yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ethan. Edith, I'll go next. Yeah, I just want to join Christina uh, and uh, just encouraging a real careful look at the possibility of two bedrooms. Uh, having a family, uh, mother, father with a child in one bedroom as the child, maybe it's fine when the child is really young, but as the child gets older, it becomes really a difficult place uh, to be. And uh, I know we did fund Bethel Gardens, a Bethel Estate for seniors. I know it's a growing population, but I'm really concerned that we have also uh, continue looking at space, uh, uh, housing for families as well. So, mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Edith. I'll respond to that. I think uh, for both um, Edith and uh, Christina, that's that was just me misspeaking on that exact floor plan for the use. I think um, where I made a mistake is that for um, kind of a smaller family like that, we would be considering the two level home. And then we do lose a little bit of full accessibility, but it would be able to serve um, a single parent with a kid and have the two bedrooms. Whereas the single bedroom, we're really looking at um, something like a single person or a single senior uh, for that unit. So I thank you for pointing that out. And I, I do wanna make that distinction that we recognize that there would need to be two bedrooms in that case. This is Sarah Waters, um, the University of Kansas. Nicholas, we typically ask in the a regular funding cycle, what happens if you didn't get this money? Um, so mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like if you could talk, speak to that. Absolutely, yeah. So this is um, a part of my job is a little to be aware of potential acquisitions or partnerships in the community. And so um, when I saw this come available, this is actually a property that we had talked with the owner about pre pre-density bonus, pre-pandemic and pre-density bonus. And I think at that time we were considering it because it would have been able to be split into two RS7 lots and just we can add an additional house. And at the time that seemed kind of like something we were waffling on the price versus the benefit that comes out of that. Um, with the density bonus, this it has uh, significant benefits for affordable housing. And I think um, Rebecca would have to speak um, to what we're able to do with that right now. But I think um, in ter terms of our revolving project funds, we would need some support from AHAB to be able to go forth and make this purchase. This Monty Sokup Chair, just to follow up on that, I'm gonna ask the but for <laughs> side of that question. Is that, are you saying that if you don't get this funding, we're probably gonna lose this opportunity? Is that what I'm hearing? Or is that a misstatement that could be put off or not? The way that I understand it, that um, this is on the market. So this is just a house 
on the market. Um, so anybody can come through and purchase this right now. The opportunity, what we would be able to do with this as an affordable housing developer um, is much different than what would likely get done with it if it was just purchased off the market. Um, and so I've spoken with the realtor. We have an agreement that she'll let me know if someone else is interested. Um, but if we, if we're able to, we would, we would need support from the housing trust fund to be able to make this acquisition. Right. Yes. Thank you for that answer. So mm -hmm. any other questions? Okay. So, uh, discussion about this. <laughs> Yeah, Thomas, go ahead. So I really like this idea. I think that um, uh, creating seven new properties really speaks to what we're doing. Uh, I, I like the, the small home thing, that book that Leah uh, had us out reading was fabulous. I bought a copy for myself. I really like the idea. I am concerned about our uh, skipping out of cycle. And does this set a precedent for uh, future projects coming in and saying, well, we've got a good idea and uh, you let, let tenants to homeowners do it. So I, I like the project a lot and I have concerns. This is Christina Gentry. Um, I, I appreciate your concern to Thomas. Um, I also recognize that we've talked about having how the application process in itself could be limiting or create even create barriers in time constraints um, and how you know maybe pushing out the applications for a larger or to allow for a, a larger pool would be something in consideration so that we can get more applicants and have more opportunities to have um, options to decide upon. So I really appreciate your concern. I also I like the adaptive work um, that sometimes follows this this process as well because this is a great um, opportunity. I I'm in favor of like the, you know we've talked about infill properties needing to be supported is how some of our money goes to support services as 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 in lieu of supporting some of the. Um, other options we have, this one being a great one. I see this happening in 20, within 24 months and that that's a great um, opportunity for time. Um, there's bus routes along ha Harper Street. There's three of them. Uh, so it allows for public transportation to be properly utilized in case there were a need for transportation as a barrier for, for the um, um, people who are, will be staying in the home. I, I kind of probably need to know a little bit more about the tend to homeowners process, like if they currently have buyers, or if there's a waiting list, if there'd be rent involved, or would the person be able to buy? So those are some questions maybe that Rebecca Buford can answer later on. Um, but I'm in favor of this. I think this is a great opportunity. I'm glad that we are being presented this today. This is Leah Roseland, Affordable Housing Administrator. I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Howell's question regarding precedent or comment regarding precedent that the Affordable Housing Advisory Board has actually accepted and allocated out of cycle um, funding awards in the past. In 2020, the Lawrence Douglas Housing um, Authority was awarded an out of cycle um, affordable housing trust fund request. So there is already precedent for doing so. And um, in addition, the next item on the agenda um, is an opportunity for the board to discuss whether um, you all would like just sort of as a standard um, process to accept ongoing applications. So that's also a change that this board could. Um, you know, move to make if you would like to see more applications like this come forward. Go ahead, Dana. Thank you. I just want to echo Christina's points here and just we've discussed alternative review of our cycle oh so many times. And, and this is a classic example of when an opportunity comes up, 
we need to be in a position to move on it and not wait so the opportunity is gone. And there's so many things that probably come up through the year that just aren't even coming to our table because of the own of our own obstacles that we've put in place by an arbitrary application uh, time. So I'm looking forward to the next item in our, on our agenda. And I also am very in favor of this project. All right, Swampy Soka Chair, are there any other comments, questions? Would anyone be willing to float a motion? I would sometime? make a motion that we accept the tenants to homeowners uh, proposition as they have put it in front of us. And I would second that motion, Christina Gentry. Okay, so we have a motion to accept, and I'm assuming that means fund this request. Um, is there any discussion? Looks like Michael Allman has his hand up. Uh, well, it's not open for public comment at this point. Um, Okay. Mr. Um, Leah, do you think our motion has enough? I mean, is it direct enough to, you know, put this into the correct funding site, you know, the right process at the city to negotiate, you know, a contract? I mean, is are we what we have on the table? Is that you think that's sufficient? I just want to make sure we don't. Um this is the Roslyn Affordable Housing Administrator. Um, if I think it would be helpful if there is clarity on just um, on the award. So, is it a motion to fund the full tenants to homeowners uh, request, or if there could be a dollar amount, that would I think be helpful. <laughs> so I'm going to ask uh, Thomas. Do you want to amend your? Yes, yeah, so I do. Give, give me a half a moment. A little, yeah, take all the time you want. Um, I'm, I'm having computer resource difficulties today, and I apologize for that. That's okay. Because I think you can make a friendly amendment or... Yeah. Give me a moment. This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, um, could we take the public comment after discussion before the vote? Uh, yeah, let's let uh, Thomas clarify his motion and then I guess we could take the public comment. Thank you. Uh -huh. Sure. So uh, I, my, my motion is that, I'm sorry, Thomas Howe, Lawrence Border Realtors Representative, uh, I move that the Affordable Housing Advisory Board uh, accept the tenants to homeowners proposal and to fund it at the level of $200,000, which is what their request has been. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. So we have an amended motion on the floor. I'd be looking for a second to that amendment. I'll go ahead and, and second that again, Christina Gentry. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Okay. So I'm going to open it up for discussion. Is there any discussion on at the board level? All right, then I'm going to open it up. Uh, I to apologize, Mr. Oh. <laughs> I apologize, Mr. Chair. This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Just wanted to clarify um, if the board um, would like to clarify the style of um, of housing that you're funding, or if it's if it's a approval for the award amount. And then whatever tenants to homeowners comes up with in terms of the layout. Well, this month you soak up chair. Their recommendation was this uh, seven house unit. 
the seventh house with the central drive. With the central drive was their proposal. And then I, what I heard from the board was that asking them to look at whether or not they could provide some two bedrooms or some amount of two bedroom units uh, with our recommend, you know, if, if that can fit on the lots and whatever. But, uh, anybody in disagreement with that? Okay. All right. So now can we take uh, Michael Allman's their comment? Hi, uh, yeah, good morning. My name is Michael Allman. I'm uh, the vice president of the Brook Creek Neighborhood Association, but I am speaking for myself today since uh, the association has not had an opportunity to be to review this. Um, and I'm sure the association would reserve the right to weigh in one way or the other in the future. So just keep that in mind. But generally mm -hmm. speaking, far as I am concerned in my neighborhood, um, we appreciate how this has been approached fairly creatively by tenants to homeowners. And also in the context that we were very concerned in previous double density um, projects that they were being done entirely on the east side of Lourdes. And that has changed. Tenants to homeowners and other agencies are definitely looking at other parts around town in keeping with the housing trust fund policy. So being that as it may, um, the context, uh, we, the, I could see that this is a viable project, um, that it's not all being, um, you know, placed on, on the small lot neighborhood side of town. Um, beyond that, as far as the particulars go, uh, to achieve density, and density is one of the main tools for affordability, but for other purposes as well, um, one of the best techniques is to build up instead of out. So for that reason, I personally, I think two-story houses are a good idea. You get more people in the same footprint. But also uh, two concerns that have been voiced not only by Brook Creek, but any number of neighborhoods, given the school district crisis right now, is that we need more housing for families, for families with children, because we're losing the demographics of children to support the number needed to keep schools open. So I would think that maybe another level of creativity could be multi-generational housing. Um, you could do a mix of housing on the lot, some small, some tiny houses. I mean, small 500 square feet is good, but tiny houses are more like 260 square feet for one individual, very compact. And then in addition to maybe a couple tiny houses, you could have a larger house, three bedroom maybe on one of the other lots. Uh, I'd like to see more of a mix, just the way that I personally look at how we can achieve density. Um, like I say, I'm not representing Brook Creek neighborhood. Uh, I don't know what the other people might think at this point. But um, I don't think there should be a problem here with some of the other issues the neighborhood were concerned with, such as drainage, which the, um, the project on 15th Street is still having drainage problems like we had predicted. Um, but this property is at 900, and, what is it? Uh, 890 foot elevation, that's 30 feet above the floodplain. So drainage shouldn't really be a problem. Uh, traffic doesn't seem like that'd be a problem. It's a collector street. Um, I would I would like to know a little more about the parking. Um, that's generally been a concern because that adds more impervious surface. But like I said, drainage shouldn't be an issue, but the parking from con the congestion maybe um, and traffic in that regard so generally speaking, you know, I, I, I can't say I would oppose this. Um, 
I would like to see a little more creativity in the types and the sizes of the housing and the mix of that those houses. So uh, once again, I, I thank Tennis to Homer for a creative project. And uh, oh, I, I think it might be wise to make your funding approval contingent on the replat. This has to go to the planning commission for a replat apparently. And uh, <laughs> can't put the cart before the horse. So you might make it contingent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate those comments. All right. Uh, closing public comment. Open it back up to the board for a final round if anybody's interested before we call the vote. All right. Seeing none, I will take the roll. Uh, Christina Gentry. I approve. Rebecca Pope. Oh, hey, Dana Ortiz. Approve. Edith Guppy. Approve. Thomas Howe. Somehow we lost Thomas. Uh, Erica Zimmerman. Approve. Sarah Waters. Approve. Thomas Allen. Approve. Uh, Monty Soka, approve. Uh, okay, that is seven for none against, uh, and that would pass. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, moving on to item three, discuss discussion on ideas for strategies for increasing affordable housing stock through the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and policy recommendations. Um, so I think the intent of this, and maybe I'll lean on Leah here a little bit, was to open up discussion about how we might, uh, I guess, change our policies or encourage additional uh, uh, proposals and things like this that came up just you know this week literally on the Harper where we might encourage people to make these kind of uh, proposals when they come up uh, out of cycle or whatever so Leah do you want to add to that this is Leah Roslin affordable housing administrator mm -hmm. um no thank you Monty I, I guess to add just a little bit of context since the last AHAB meeting in January, um, there have been several of the Affordable Housing Advisory Board members who have come to me with ideas or recommendations. Um, and I thought that it would just be beneficial for the whole board to have an opportunity to discuss that. Um, the ideas and recommendations have both been, you know, in terms of the affordable housing trust fund um, cycles and priorities, but also in terms of policy recommendations that this board might um, want to consider moving, you know, up to the city commission or planning commission. Um, both of those um, I guess duties are within the bylaws of the Affordable Housing Advisory Board. And so again, just kind of wanted to have this opportunity for an open discussion and dialogue about some ideas to make them public and for the full board to have a chance to weigh in. And then um, if anything, you know, needs to be taken back, um, we can we can revisit it at later meetings. Okay, um, Monty Soka Chair, uh, welcome back, Rebecca. Thank you for keeping track of us. Um, well, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure where to go with this, other than to open it up. If people have brought forward ideas, I know Tom or I know uh, um, Ron brought for some ideas and of course he's not here to speak to those today. Uh, any other thoughts on this is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Well, if we could, since it was um, 
it, it was um, recommended by a couple of board members to um, accept out of cycle proposals um, and some ideas have been thrown around in terms of, you know, keeping some in reserves or how we might, um, I guess, uh, with the goal of um, continuing to encourage more affordable housing units to be developed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Small piece of chair, we have batted around that idea several times and we talked about actually holding back funds uh you know annually to have a small pool of money that could be uh awarded out of cycle and it just so happens that this time that happened naturally we did not do that intentionally it just kind of happened naturally and uh, we have those funds but that wouldn't always be the case many times we've awarded basically every dollar we had available uh which i don't you know isn't necessarily a bad practice either uh, other than we potentially miss opportunities um Anybody have any thoughts on that? Is there a desire to consider, you know, trying to keep a small reserve? I mean, ultimately, you know, at the end of the cycle, we're, we're going to spend that. Go ahead, Rebecca. Rebecca Buford with Tenants to Homeowners. Um, I know one idea that I can throw into this is a um, loan fund. And I know we've talked about this and Ron had really liked this idea. Um, that and and Monty had said, well, we couldn't build it immediately, but we may put in a little bit each year from our main fund that is actually a loan revolve uh, like a revolving fund that allows tenants, homeowners, or habitat, or any is particularly developing units that you could use that fund to acquire and get you know on those times when something becomes available immediately that you have to work with the real estate market and, and timing. Um, and then those funds would be paid back either at a very low interest rate, so less than construction financing or even at a zero interest rate, but they'd be recouped in 12 or 24 months that could then be reallocated. That could be a really amazing tool, even if we said, $200,000 a year for the next five years, we're going to put into that revolving fund. And then we could get up to a, you know, a million dollars in there where we could easily um, give that to someone to buy something, which a lot of times our issue is the, the immediate terms. I can write grants later to get funding, but like in this case, and thank you all for your support on this one. Um, I do think it's, a really good amount to get that many units, um, but it would go on the market before I would have the ability to write an application and get those funds in. So um, a revolving loan fund could still help all of us take advantage of those, but not grant it out. It could continue to work its magic over the years. So that might be something we want to think about. And there's a lot of trust funds that have a revolving loan fund as part of their practice. Monty soak up chair. So is what I understand what you just described. So is the project today, the one we reviewed today, would that have been a potential project that could have literally been a loan, which would which we would have eventually got back the principal at some point? Or is that or is that as a project today, like it was it was a grant no matter what? I'm well, I, I don't know that I can say, I mean, of course I could get more funds. The grant we're at, or we really needed some subsidy on that. And we're only okay. asking for the acquisition, right? I still have to come up with all the funding to build the houses and okay. sell them, you know. And as Christina mentioned, if we can do home ownership, we can sell them and get some money back. So I don't need as much subsidy. If I'm doing all rental housing, I need even more subsidy, right? Because right. it's equity gets that actually right. gets tied up on a rental. So it depends on the mixture and what we want to do, um, how much okay. subsidy I need. But that initial, I always need something to make it affordable, right? Otherwise, I can't sell it affordably. Mm -hmm. um, there's got to be something that writes down that cost. Um, but I, I, your point is good, Monty. Whatever that is, whether that grant funding comes from you guys and that's 
and the revolving loan fund allows us to build and then sell, right? And then return it. I mean, that's a, a financing tool or the, the grant fund, or I'm sorry, the loan fund allows us to acquire and then we can find other grants and, and pay the loan fund back. I mean, I just, whatever tools we have to access those opportunities, um, you know, can work. Right. Well, I find that intriguing, this Monty soak up chair, I find the, the loan program kind of intriguing in the sense that if we want to have a funding out there that's flexible and we could award at any time outside of the cycle, it could be the loan program because essentially like a project like this, you could have come and asked for the loan, got the $200,000 to make the acquisition you wanted. You could have come then come back in a, in a regular grant cycle and say, this is the kind of subsidy that the project needs. Now that might be a little more difficult to sell at that point, I don't know, but um, it's, it's an interesting concept in that it could give us some flexibility outside of pure grants, uh, which we really want to have kind of competition. You know, we want a competitive, somewhat competitive process to get the best projects on the grants. So um, it's interesting. Anybody else? Yes, um, I want to take us in a, another comment on the loan program. I'll, I'll wait. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering why I'm on the screen twice, but other than that, um, <laughs> I'm wondering whether we need a marketing campaign. Um, because we seem to get... Um, if we, if we open up our cycle also, I want to make sure that more people know about that and that we are able to attract more, uh, more applications from different sources. And I wonder if we need to be more aggressive. It seems like we're passive waiting for applicants to come to us. I wonder if we need to be more aggressive in searching out uh, encouraging, uh, maybe meeting with people, helping them understand what we're trying to do, um, just being more aggressive in telling the story, seeking applica applications. I don't know how to do that. Maybe other uh, others do. Maybe other cities have done it. And we can learn from them. But it, it feels like we're very passive, waiting for applicants to come to us. And those that know us come. Um, I think we saw this in our last round that um, from the private sector didn't have a clue. And I wonder if maybe it's on us to do a little more marketing about what we need and uh, that we're anxious to partner with people. This is, this is Sarah Waters. I, you know, I agree a lot with what Edith says and I, and like even the idea of the loan pieces, like it, you kind of have to be known, a known entity to know how to go through this. So again, which is what we saw in the last cycle. So as we're thinking about strategies, right, for increasing the stock, affordable housing stock, in this discussion, we've tossed around a couple of times of you know a staff person that was designated or somebody who could take those for-profit developers that want to participate and help, but also walk them through as they're doing their proposal. So again, just trying to think of strategies that, again, marketing that out, talking to people about, you know, maybe it's, you know, Nicholas Ward, I know has talked a lot about things that he did, trying to help, Monty, you did things, trying to help. So is there a designated person or is there kind of a pre-application person that could, could help those folks? And to understand that a lot of the work, they're, they're gonna have to come up with a lot of, answers ahead of time um, or propose out ahead of time or, you know, key things we're looking for maybe in terms of that affordable tr affordability or um, permanent affordability or things. And so um, I would say on the loan piece, just also quickly, I, I like the idea, but what I was also hearing was we're going to hear a grant proposal then coming on those probably 
a lot of times, which again, but it's that land acquisition is what I was hearing. Lots become available, there's potential, you need to grab them and then figure out how to develop it, um, which is, is cool, but it's also a, a little bit of the, well, we did this, although I guess if a loan's gonna be paid back and we could deny it on the other side of the grant proposal too. So, um, so now I, I'll stop because I like that idea. So I think that's another really cool strategy because again, a lot opens, you need to buy it, <laughs> especially in the current market as I understand it in Lawrence, so. This Monty Sokup chair, I will, uh, I want to tag team on the marketing campaign idea. And I think having personally had some of those conversations with three different developers, I think it's more of an educational process than it is a marketing. I think there are a few people out there with interest, not what I would necessarily, what I would call charitable interest. Uh, they're interested in the idea. They think it looks, you know, it's uh, appealing. It's the right thing to do. But as a developer, you're ultimately still there to make money. And yet, if it doesn't pencil out for you, you're probably not going to do it. There just isn't that charitable intent, right? So um, I think that is an education process. And I don't, I don't say that I have the answer or know how to do that exactly, other than. I, so I know I personally have met with three different developers to try to educate them, um, including uh, calling the engineer on this last project where they were trying to get property annexed into the city with, uh, uh, so I, you know, I reached out to the developer there and tried to say, you know, here, here's the public benefit. How do you, how are you creating public benefit and here's how it could work with affordable housing. Uh, and I actually have a follow-up meeting with them because their proposal did get rejected at the city level for the annexation. So maybe with that rejection, they're more interested in uh, talking, you know? So I think there's an education process we have uh, to uh, for them because it just doesn't come natural in the private sector. Yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. This is, oh. Go ahead, Leah. This is Leah Rislin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Thanks, Rebecca. I was just going to um, follow up on uh, Ms. Guffey and Ms. Waters' comments. Um, that's part of my role. So the city does have a staff member <laughs> designated to do that work. And um, it, I recognize that it happens behind the scenes and doesn't necessarily get reported to the Affordable Housing Advisory Board, but those conversations and education are happening. And, um, you know, this is um, a newer position. Um, I think I've been in the position nine months. And so we're still, you know, developing um, the more formal processes for what that looks like, but that's absolutely a priority and, and work that's being done. Um, and um, there, I'll be working on some projects to offer more formalized education and support and sort of, you know, uh, uh, path forward for all types of developers interested in creating more affordable housing. So we've definitely uh, recognized that that's important work to be done and would welcome any feedback or support from the board in that. But um, that's that's absolutely um, part of my role and work that's happening. Thank you, Lisa. Rebecca Buford with Tenants to Homeowners. Um, Leah, I'm glad you said that because that's what I was partly going to say was that Leah has really been doing that. And I know that it is a new role and um, we're trying, we're all trying to help kind of what are those educational tools that we need as a community, as a city, as an advisory board um, and to have city staff, you know, make available. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a menu like ways in which developers can uh, participate um, with affordable housing. So there's kind of a bunch of different ideas. We've, we're talking about policies on, and incentives um, detailed that will allow them to imagine a little bit better, give them some, some exact examples about what, how they could participate if they want to. But I'd like to ask Edith a little more, um, who, who are we missing or anyone 
for that matter, at the table, I'd, I'd really like to, I don't disagree. I, I just want to, I guess I want to feel that out a little bit more of who, what players do we want at the table? Because I, I mean, I do have an opinion that we will not get for-profit developers to the extent that we will get nonprofit developers whose mission is below market rate housing, right? I mean, we can't be that naive. Not to say we don't want to incentivize those collaborations and public-private partnerships, um, but what other collaborators are do we want to market for and, and get to the table? I'm, I'm, I want to know more. Rebecca, I don't know who we're missing at the table uh, because what I know is uh, as a person that's fairly new to Lawrence, it's, it's actually who you know. And if you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> uh, there is a kind of insider group in Lawrence. And until you get in it, you're totally out of it. Things happen in Lawrence. And if you don't, if you're not in that group, you don't know about it. <clears throat> and um, if you're in the group, you don't know that there are people who are out of it. It's not an intentional thing. It just happens. But, but I'm wondering if there's other groups that could do affordable housing that we're missing. I'm not aware of them. So I, I'm, I mean, again, if we're talking for-profit developers, yeah, I think there's ways we can definitely give them education and tools to create that. Um, but I really do think there's, um, that we do know most of the nonprofit mission-oriented groups, and not to say they have to be nonprofit, but the groups, the organizations, the um, some of the even um, community organizations that have applied and we want them to continue to, and I, I think we need to continue to outreach to them, some of the more grassroots organizations. But I would say most of the organizations at the table are pretty Lawrence-focused grassroots. None of us are like Unite, National United Way. Um, and uh, that most of the housing, people that are dealing with housing are, are at the table. So I'm just wondering if we're hoping for other partners that just may not actually exist in Lawrence. Because I'd love to have 10 more partners. But <laughs> Go ahead, Dana. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dana Ortiz, Family Promise of Lawrence. I think Edith has a really good point here about, call it marketing or education, and to, to others to, to cast the net out to, to have creativity and an example of where this has happened and it hasn't had enough fire and time to stew yet, but um, is the, the ARPA money and the county, um, Rebecca and Erica and I cast a net out to congregations of faith who might have property. And there's a chance, have you thought about using some of your property for affordable housing development? And the conversations were really rather exciting. From, from groups that hadn't been at the table before. And Monty was part of one of those meetings as well. So I think that if we limit ourselves without some really intentional outreach of the opportunities, one, and two, decrease the barriers, like oh, become more flexible. We had a reason um, to put our grant cycle where it was because of the tax credit uh, item right, Rebecca, initially, but but separating that out, some foundations, including Douglas County Community Foundation, has a community grant and it has a, a, a winter spring cycle and a fall cycle, and you can only apply to one each year, but they're separate times, something like that to allow us to be more flexible to the needs as they come up, I think would be very useful as, as well as making an intentional outreach to, to organizations, to neighborhoods. There's, there's properties in most neighborhoods that are empty and I know the neighbors would love to have something done with those properties too. So casting that vision out, I think is, is gonna be useful.
this monkey took a chair. Thank you, Dana. Thank, or thank you, everyone. I'm going to uh, try to draw this to a conclusion so we can move on with our agenda. But I heard basically two things that looking at some kind of loan fund may be helpful. Um, and then secondly, having some kind of educational or more aggressively getting our word out there that we're looking for opportunities and partners. So I'm gonna maybe ask Leah to, you know, in the coming months or whatever, to kind of maybe look at other cities with programs like ours that have these kinds of programs or have done this and kind of see what some of the best practices might be and kind of come back to this committee with some either suggestions or, or forward us information. So I'm gonna go to Dana here. Go ahead, Dana. Um, just one, add one other piece about that, an opened up flexible intentional process to be more flexible in our time, okay. in our uh, calendar time, please. Okay, so it also opened up, uh, maybe break down our <laughs> single cycle and, and look at opportunities to be able to do things outside a cycle or create a cycle that gives more flexibility. So we could kind of take a look at those things and see what's out there and um, go from there. Okay, um, I have a public okay. comment here. Monty, if you wouldn't mind, um, I just wanted to kind of oh. chime in before we close up um, our discussion about yeah. policies and practices. It's Christina Gentry. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't, you know, kind of plug away at um, an issue or a continuing issue. I think we've, we've touched upon, um, I'm thinking about the um, very great presentation that was given that included um, understanding about the trailer homes and trailer home parks that we have. Um, and that also talks about income. Um, I would like to talk about maybe looking at how we can make a persuasive argument to our county um, about making income a protected class or as a protected class. I know we've talked about it before and it's something that, you know, we've maybe mold over a little bit in our discussions here. Um, but I'm thinking about how filing taxes this year and how the IRS has figured out how to um, increase or get income from those who have um, maybe some a very, uh, I would say, pers maybe, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but uh, people who are, are gaining income online or people who have other ways that they are filing or they're including or, or increasing um, their their financial um, capacities. So um, I would like to just kind of make it so that I put a little needle in that, uh, that maybe we can somehow talk about how to create incentives for those who uh, place income as a protective class uh, going forward. And we can talk about maybe adding that in some way as a policy and how it affects affordable housing. So that's a lot of things right there. I'm not really sure about our capacity to do so, but I'd like to keep that discussion going. Thank you, Christina. I would uh, just add on to that, that the HR committee Human Resources Committee, uh, we passed over that recommendation to them and they are currently working on that. I do not know it. I can't say that I do know what the status is on that. Uh, but uh, we could probably find out before the next month and kind of maybe get a report back on maybe where they are in that process because that was handed out of our committee. Okay, anyone else? I have, a, like I said, I have a person on here for public comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Leah Rose on Affordable Housing Administrator. I can actually just provide a quick update that right now um, there's okay. a subcommittee that's looking at um, ordinance draft language. So uh, looking at other peer communities and um, just starting to draft some language um, with the goal, I believe, of taking it back to the full HRC um, in, the, in the spring. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. Um, can we let uh, Michael Allman has his hand up? Would like to make a comment? Uh, yes, thank you once again, uh, Mr. Sokup. My name is Michael Allman, and speaking for myself, um, yeah, I, the there were several members of this board, uh, Mr. Sokup as well, who attended the planning commission last month, discussing the 
100 acre annexation and rezoning request that was going to, uh, they propose all low density, single dwelling housing and no affordability element whatsoever. Um, and I think it's really smart that that you all attended there and particularly addressing the situation where, I mean, it's, it's one thing to get agencies involved to be more partnering with with uh, tenants to homeowners or the, or the board in general, you know, more agencies to build affordable housing. It's another thing as you know well and have been looking at forever is how to find the land. Um, it's gonna be continuing hit or miss finding existing lots like the one on Harper that's just gonna come up every now and then and you might be able to strike when the iron's hot but we know that there's going to be land growing in the city in the periphery that's gonna be up for annexation. That's gonna be happening because of developers. And so you're really smart to be talking to developers. Um, you're also very smart to be looking at the leverage that we can get from the community benefit. And if, if some of you don't understand Plan 2040 and the policies that uh, are geared towards increasing infill density in Lawrence, it pretty much all comes down to this community benefit. When land is annexed, a developer, according to Plan 2040, has to provide a community benefit that is above and beyond what serves the development itself, something in addition. And <laughs> affordability is is a prime candidate for that benefit. So I think it'd be important that not only that members like Mr. Sokup or, or, um, or Rebecca make comments about using that community benefit, I think the board should take that up as a policy to make a statement that this is a very important way that Lawrence could increase the uh, land availability simply by working with developers who then make that community benefit affordability. Um, beyond that, I mean, you have lots of tools in your toolbox. Um, the organization I'm with said, suggested the city have the legislature come up with an energy efficient mortgage program. That would mean that if you build houses that are very highly energy efficient, zero net with solar, um, and that basically have minimal, if any, utility payments, that's a saving that's ongoing where, you know, a, a tenant would, would be, it'd be more affordable because they're not paying utilities because it's a zero net energy house and they would qualify for energy efficient mortgage. We don't have the energy efficient mortgage uh, program yet in the state of Kansas, but nevertheless, if the house is zero net energy, it just saves month to month on utilities. And there are all kinds of other tools in your toolbox that you could use to address affordability beyond just the price of land. Um, so I would suggest that you investigate many more of those tools and see how you could utilize them to augment what you're doing right now. And and I, I think the work you're doing is good, um, but I, I I challenge you to be a little more expansive, shall I say. So thank you for your work and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Allman. Uh, I see Ron uh, joined us here. So I am, uh, unless somebody has a burning comment, I'm gonna close this item and we're gonna move on to the next. Uh, Next thing on the agenda. Uh, so that is the Affordable Housing Advisory Board Annual Draft Report Review. I trust everyone has had an opportunity to take a look at that report. Um, so we don't have to bring it up on screen and review, but uh, are there any comments on the report? Go ahead, Rebecca. Rebecca Buford with Tents to Homeowners. Um, Leah, I thought it looked very 
Very good. Very wonderful. I wanted to ask a question to the board um, and to Leah on our short term goal, um, goal two, which is home ownership units, which of course are is the most challenging goal, I think, because we all know the cost of those is is the highest and there's no land or um, and building costs have exploded. So it's not surprising to me that we're least far along with those units. However, I I did want to, I was thinking of painting the picture, you know, you guys are so supportive of the community housing trust and permanent affordability. And the reality is during 2019 to 2021, there were also a 10 more resales, which are very low number than usual because of COVID. But 10 new buyers got into homes that were resold in trust which I think is is new units to new households. Um, so I'm think, I'm wondering if you want to add that to our numbers when we look at have we created new affordability home ownership opportunity for low income families. Um, those resales should count as units. That's Monty, soak up chair. Um, that's a good point, Rebecca. I'm not, it would take some more convincing to tell me they're new units, but certainly it's a statistic we should be tracking because it shows the value of permanent affordability and the houses that go into that trust. I'm not sure, I, I would have to, I don't know. I got I to think about that a little bit more about whether those are actually new units because somebody I think would challenge us on that and say we're not counting correctly, but certainly it's a metric that we should be tracking and saying, look at the value of these permanently affordable homes. Yeah, Monty, and I agree, it's not a new unit, but it is it's certainly people making serve. a unit available mm -hmm. below market value affordably. And, and that also means that many folks moved on to not need subsidy. Right. Um, so yeah, you're right, a, a different, another sentence or two, but I think it goes to that short-term goal because that's 10 more families that got into the market affordably, okay. um, even without creating 10 new units. Right, good point. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. Um, Ron Gacious, uh, Chamber Representative on the AHAB board. Uh, I like the idea of tracking that number also but but like you, Monty, I have some concerns about including it in the new unit category. If we did that year after year, it would show up like we've actually created additional housing units when what we've done is we've housed additional families. So I so to me it's a slightly different metric, but I think it's one that bears shining some light on and tracking separately because this, this res, resale of the homes in the permanently affordable uh, inventory should become a really important component of what we're trying to do. Yeah, thank you, Ron. This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. I'm wondering, since um, we have the Affordable Housing Advisory Board retreat coming up in the next few months where the board will be looking at setting new goals and updating previous goals, if we might want to consider just adding that as a new goal um, with you know that data that we will begin tracking and maybe not put it in last year since it wasn't a goal and data that we were tracking, but planning on that moving forward, if there's an interest in that. Yeah, this is Monty Soak up Chair. I think that's a good idea, Leah, and we can certainly add that. You'll make a note to <laughs> make sure we get it covered. Um, I also want to note that uh, Edith had to drop off today, but I want to thank her for, her, uh, for attending while she could today. Certainly helped us earlier in the discussion, so. Any other comments on the draft report? Rebecca, um, with tenants to homeowners, um, can you, uh, Leah or, or Danny or whoever, um, the 39 renter and homeowner units that have been funded with trust funds and CDBG funds, the, the 29 units completed to date that have been 
accessibility modifications? What what does that all include? This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. I will actually need to pull up the um, spreadsheet. Um, I don't have that up right now, but I will search for it and get it up ASAP. This is Danny Walters um, with Planning and Development Services. Um, I believe that those are the uh, Independence Inc. Um, rehabs that before um, they were applying for CDBG loan or CDBG funding to do those projects and they are not anymore, but I think that that's what, what those numbers are for. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Danny. Any other questions? Okay, so I think I would like to, uh, I would like to have a, and I don't know if this needs to be a motion, but I think we want to approve the draft with any minor edits so that we can uh, approve the report and it can get published. Uh, and I don't think we actually had any edits for this specific time. So can I get a motion to approve the annual report as written? The draft report so we can make it a final report. So moved. Thomas Howe moved. Sarah Waters second. Okay, Sarah Waters second. Is there any discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, I will call the vote. And okay, Christina Gentry. I approve. Rebecca Buford. Approve. Dana Ortiz. Approve. Thomas Howe. Yes. Ron Gages. Approve. Erica Zimmerman. Approve. Sarah Waters. Approve. Thomas Allen. Approve. Uh, Monty Soka approved. That is uh, motion passes 9 0. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund uh, 2021 final reports. Again, I trust everyone had an opportunity to take a look at those. Um, were there any comments on any or any concerns anybody has? All right, Leah, do, is there any action needed on this? This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Um, nope, just as an FYI and the board wishes to have any discussion, but no action is needed. Okay, well, thank you. I thought those, uh, go ahead, Dana. Um, one thing on a, a few of the comments that I watched when I had to recuse, many of us have to recuse during the period of time. It's important for us to all remember that these reports are required and that they are part of the public record and, and every grantee uh, who receives a re reward is required to report on the progress and, and the, uh, the finalization of that funding. Thank you, Dana. That's a good note. and. Again, I'll just point out that when we're talking to private developers and doing affordable housing and taking grant funds, this is the part that they part of the stuff that they don't understand. They have no idea that these things exist and that they have to report back out to someone other than their own boards. And uh, it's part of the difficulty of getting them engaged. So, uh, and uh, to me, that's why it's important that we have when we reach out to those folks, we have a not-for-profit partnership of people that do understand so we get this data back and get good information. So, uh, moving on, we'll go to uh, quick updates. Uh, so we have, uh, I think this is mostly uh, staff going to do this, the home 2022 allocation discussion. This is Danny Walters with Planning and Development Services. This was just to remind you all that uh, you will be looking at the home um, application requests next meeting. Um, I know that um, as, as staff, we are getting those prepared to send out to you so you have plenty of time to review those applications. So just, just kind of a reminder that it's coming for, for next month. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, and moving on to the next item, we have a letter of support for the City Affordable Housing Rural housing projects is submitted in the Douglas County discussion. 
Go ahead, Leah. This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Um, this is another kind of just FYI for the board. Um, there's a group uh, that's been meeting a subcommittee of an acquisitions um, team that includes affordable housing and non uh, developers and nonprofit social services that provide affordable housing and housing supports. Um, there uh, is a list that was generated of of, um, good acquisition um, projects um, that could be supported by county ARPA funds. And so the letter is um, a letter of support from the city um, that we have asked uh, city manager to sign signaling our support um, for those acquisitions and support of mutual goals for affordable housing and homelessness prevention. Okay. Small piece of culture. Thank you, Leah. Uh, moving on to the next item, we have the Kansas Housing Resources Corporation uh, presentation to the City Commission. This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Yes, yeah, so the um, um, Kansas Housing Resources Corporation completed their um, Kansas statewide housing assessment report and have been um, going to different communities to make presentations on the findings of that assessment. Um, our city commission had um, asked that they present at a city commission meeting, which they did in January. And so I've just provided links to that presentation for the AHAB to view in addition to the themes and other report materials for board members to review. Thank you, Leah. Any comments on that? Any takeaways? Okay. Okay, that moves us on to uh, new business. Is there any new business? Yeah, Ron. I apologize for not being here the first hour plus of the meeting. So I don't know if this issue maybe had been raised previously, but if not, I'd like to see us pursue it a bit. Um, having watched the Garber annexation um, proposal, um, basically go down in flames and then be withdrawn. Uh, I continue to be very concerned about the lack of available lots for development in the community, um, concerned about the lack of development, uh, uh, developable lots for affordable housing projects, but really for any housing projects at any price point, but, but most specifically affordable housing pro projects. So, my my interest is, is it, um, I, I'd like to ask that staff bring us back some um, policy options that we could consider that would allow perhaps um, a property owner by right to build a duplex any place that's zoned single family residence, uh, conceivably, you know, at its maximum utilization, that could roughly double the number of new home units that we would have space for. Um, I, I, I just, I just think that we're we're not seeing developers come forward with for-profit projects that fit our needs. And one of our most immediate needs is some developable lots. And um, you know, duplex projects tend to be towards the midpoint or lower uh, in the price point in the marketplace. People aren't building seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar, you know, duplexes. Um, but it but it would certainly open up uh, consideration for building additional units if if a landowner could by right put a duplex any place that a single family home is currently zoned for. Um, I'm sure we would want to look at, you know, certain lot restrictions. Um, right now we've got a, a certain, you know, you have to have a certain size lot or larger before you can build a duplex. Perhaps we should consider making the minimum lot a little bit smaller than it is right now. Any, anything that we could look at 
to uh, expand the availability of buildable lots for the low end and mid price point homes, I think would really be beneficial. So if we could ask staff to bring us back what some of those policy options might be for us to consider at a future meeting. Uh, I think some of them were even mentioned in our in the toolbox that was developed two or three years ago. And we haven't really gone back and pursued those very, very much. Okay. Thank you, Ron. All right, I guess, Leah, I will ask, is that possible for us to, for the, you guys to start looking at what some of those kind of options might be? To, I mean, if we think about lot generation, uh, what we might be able to do to incentivize that. This is Leah Roslin, Affordable Housing Administrator. Absolutely, I will um, connect with Jeff Crick and I'm not sure if we'll have that information for the March meeting, but as soon as possible, we will get that back. Oh, I see Jeff just logged on. Afternoon all, Jeff Crick, Planning Building Services Director. I um, just wanted to put a, a reminder out there that the city is currently undertaking a review and revision of the city's land development code, which has some of this kind of language and um, asking of the consultants to look at this as part of our programming. And so we, we've had it kind of programmed in our thought to have that conversation with them, but we did always entertain other ideas that we could help loop into that review and revision process to help kind of go through those goals. And one of the stated items in the RFP is to find ways to be more, um, develop more affordable and workforce housing. And so we can also get anybody a copy of that RFP, which is on our website, that would be helpful too. I just wanted to share that bit of information. Small piece of chair. Thank you, Jeff. Mr. Chairman, yeah. a question go for ahead, Ron. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Uh, Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. Jeff, could you provide us a little bit of an update of where we're at on that process and creating the specs for that uh, review, or do do we have an RFP out, or you know what what's kind of the timing for that process? Jeff Craig, Planning and Development Services. Certainly, uh, the process is currently interviewing uh, consultants, so it's in the very early stages of that beginning of trying to bring someone on board. But it is it is currently ongoing. We hope to be able to wrap that up. Um, fairly soon, quite truthfully, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And then we'd like to, you know, make sure to provide input back, or excuse me, provide um, an update back to you all so you can know where we're at in the process and where that goes. And we envision that to be a, a pretty, um, hopefully a very quick process. We hopefully wrap that up in a couple of years from the first beginning of it to going to the end with the code. And we hope to have a, a very large and, and fully developed uh, public input process together from not just individuals that we we hear from but also kind of reaching out to people in different aspects of the community and different subsets and and it just a as broad as possible engagement as we can as part of that but it's um still very early days and we're still in that part of uh, getting a consultant on board yeah go ahead ron um uh, mr chairman just a comment I'm in my second term on the Affordable Housing Advisory Board. We've kind of sort of been looking at these types of ideas through our side eye for the four years that I've been on board. I, I would hate to think that I'm going to rotate off this board before we even have a draft code recommendation back from a consultant before we can even consider this idea. So. You know, if Ahab doesn't want to take a look at this in advance of the full review of the code, well, that's fine. Uh, but it would be my intention then to pivot and try to do something through my own individual initiative, which will be pointless and wasted because city commissioners will say, oh, well, we've got a code review underway. Can't we wait to see what that comes up with? Our availability of lot situation is going to suck in two years. It's already not very good. And, and we're building what, just over 100 new units a year. Uh, I don't see any new lots coming on board anytime soon. You know, we've, we've told the gentleman in the southeast part of town last couple of months that we don't have any money available to build a street so that he could put new lots in uh, the Garber folks were kind of booed out of the arena with their proposal uh, that would have provided um, 
I don't know, what, a couple hundred new lots? Uh, I don't see anybody working in the community to create availability of new space to build homes. And I don't intend to wait until I've completely rotated off of this uh, advisory board before I have an opportunity to make comments and, and urge policymakers to uh, consider that project. So if Ahab's not interested in it, that's fine. We can wait to see what the, the uh, planning uh, consultants recommend. But, but I think this is an issue that has become, um, it's certainly a critical issue now. And I think we're transitioning to it being a crisis issue. And I just, you know, I, I look at what other communities are doing with the ARPA funds. You know, Kansas City, Missouri is putting $12.5 million into affordable housing initiatives with their ARPA funds. And we're sitting here and wondering if we can put a duplex on a single family residential lot. I think, I think we are underplaying our hand and we're letting we're letting the normal slow inertia of city action prevent us from getting real things done on a timely basis to meet the needs that are out there. And you know, I, I just see us having a need to lean in much harder than we are right now and trying to get something done. But I mean, everything's on hold. For the next two years, we're gonna hear repeatedly. Well, you know, we've got an outside consultant bringing us recommendations on how to improve our code program. So for two years, we don't do squat. That makes no sense to me at all. Mr. Chair. Dina Gentry, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut uh, someone off. I just wanted to just kind of clarify and that I feel your passion on this subject, Ron. Um, are you suggesting maybe, and, and maybe it's not a suggestion, maybe it's just a, just a, a thought um, of maybe uh, this board uh, doing something in the way of, of making a, a, a formal form of intent or FOI or some sorts of a um, to to the to the commission about the ARPA funds funding and and I don't know if that even makes sense because we're receiving tax taxes which goes into our big bucket of what we're able to give applicants but are you suggesting in some way that this board um, look into uh, trying to acquiesce some of those ARPA funds for, for the purpose of affordable housing and purchasing of lots. Um, maybe I'm hearing a little bit of, of an assumption that we need more money or we need more lots, we need more opportunity. Um, what would your suggestion be? Go ahead, Ron. Mr. Chairman, Ron Gacious, Chamber Representative. My first year on this advisory board, County Commissioner Nancy Thelman was on the advisory board with us. And I remember one of the first conversations I had one-on-one -on -one with Nancy, we were talking about the new sales tax dollars and how they were going to flow into the housing trust fund. And she said, one of the biggest, she, and I think she's made this point publicly with the advisory board, not just in a private conversation with, with uh, myself, but she said, one of the biggest challenges we will be confronted with is where do we find the money to get the job done because a million dollars a year isn't going to uh, make much of a dent in the problem. Those are my words characterizing what I heard from her three and a half years ago. Um, you know, yeah, I think we ought to be asking for ARPA funds. You know, what I've been told is, is we've used, at least at the city level, most of the ARPA funds to plug holes in our budget. Well, I thought a lot of that was supposed to go to address public needs like housing. Other communities are doing that. Um, but, but more specifically, I'm trying to get us to move on some of the issues that we have in front of us like cost of lots, unavailability of lots. Um, you know, we've talked about what, we, we've spent two years talking about gee, are there any publicly um, city-owned or church-owned or not-for-profit-owned lands that would be available to build affordable housing on? We've talked about it for a couple of years. I haven't seen a single project come forward. And every time I mention two, you know, 10 square yards of land that's on a park that the city owns that nobody even seems to walk across, I'm given a half dozen reasons 
of why we can't put housing there. So I'm, I'm becoming increasingly frustrated. My time in this role is slipping away and I would grade myself as like a C minus right now for what, what we've gotten done. You just look at the annual reports that we've you know just approved, I guess. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not getting to the Super Bowl with the way we're working towards our goals. We haven't made the playoffs. And um, I'm, uh, I, for, for myself, my frustration levels are rising. I, I want to see us develop more of a sense of urgency. I feel like other problems have stepped in front of us so far as the public's awareness is concerned and that, and that people are forgetting that you can't address any of these other societal inequities if people don't have housing. And we're still stuck trying to get stuff done with an old system that doesn't work to address today's needs. And, you know, what I'm hearing is we're going to be a couple of more years before we're going to get recommendations back from a consultant. And, oh, by the way, then we're going to do a lot of, you know, public input sessions and that type of thing. We, we know what the problems are. We just have a tremendous hesitancy to move forward on them, in, in my view. Thanks, Ron. I think Thomas is going to move in there. Yeah. Um, um, Thomas Howe, large board of realtors representative. And I will echo what Ron says and amplify it a little bit. Our organization, large board of realtors, are often thought of as being self-serving and in it for our own ends. Uh, and, and whenever we say we need more places to build, we are... Uh, we're, we're reprimanded as, oh, you are only trying to make more money, which is not accurate. The public good is really important. We serve on this board because affordable housing is something that our community badly, badly needs. And we will not get more affordable housing until we can get more housing. And until we are able to, to, to build more to do more development, to build more houses, we are going to be struggling. You know, Rebecca brings up, well, we've got 10 more properties into affordability. Well, the same properties into affordability. We should be able to bring in, I mean, what's, what's our objective? How, how, many, how many houses should we be talking about? 2,000? I mean, it wasn't that the, the long-term goal that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. We're never going to do 2,000 houses. It is not going to happen until the, the powers that be say, we understand the problem. The problem is we need to develop more dirt for more houses. And Ron, I, 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 I agree with your frustration. I have the same frustrations as well. And uh, uh, your, your C minus might be optimistic. Generous. Mr. Chairman, one, one other comment that's partially response to Christina's question of what motivates me. In the last three weeks, I've had conversations with two planning commission members who have said, why aren't you guys bringing us any recommendations on um, uh, changing the code to allow more affordable housing to be built? That's coming to me from planning commissioners who have heard me rail against them for slowing us up. And now they're saying, where are your proposals? I heard all this passion a year ago, and then you guys disappeared. You know, I don't think we need to be waiting for city staff to select a consultant if we have in mind a recommendation that we think would increase availability of lots. You know, the problem's not going away. The problem's not on hold unless we let it go on hold. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely frustrated. And, you know... I didn't know what to say to those folks. Well, I'll bring it up at Ahab. And they said, well, yeah, get something to us, you know? So, you know, it, it's, um, well, I'm, now I'm being redundant. So I'll, I'll just shut down. Rebecca, go ahead. Well, I'd like to make a motion that, um, that Leah and, Ahab, I mean, that we do come up with some ideas 
to suggest to planning in the meantime before their two-year process? And I talked to Craig Owens about this. I, I can't agree more with Monty uh, or uh, with uh, Ron and um, Thomas that, I mean, we're way behind the curve and we need more creative density options to create a smidgen of what we need. So, I mean, I don't agree that if we let developers develop anything that we're going to get a lot more affordable housing, though there will be a need to make money there. But I think the combination of allowing more supply at all levels and incentivizing and making rule, making requirements like community benefit that provide some of the higher, the lower income units is the only way we'll get close. So yeah, we need all of those things simultaneously to be happening. And uh, I think we need to, or uh, Craig Owen said, we understand you, we can't wait two years to solve this problem and that we can have incremental steps in change in the development code. So I would make a motion um, to agree with Ron that we present, we come up with some of those steps um, like allowing uh, duplexes on other single family lots and other best practices from across the country to create lower price point density and housing um, opportunities. I think we can at least be making some suggestions while the development code is being looked at and with urgency, um, just as the last two speakers have, have said. This is Monty Sokup, Chair. So we have a motion on the floor to uh, basically generate ideas to present back to the city or the commission or planning commission or whoever that, whatever group we ultimately decide that is. Uh, that incentivize density and the creation of affordable lots, uh, anything that would get us basically more houses on the ground. Um, do I have a second for that? Ron Gacious. Okay, Ron. Chamber representative second. So um, we, I guess if we have, okay, so we have a motion and a second, I'm gonna open up discussion and I, uh, I'm gonna open up discussion and say, I think we should probably put you know, do we work at that and have part of our retreat around that and, and get this, you know, kind of on the road and so we have you know, put a little bit of timeline to it. Uh, that would be my other suggestion for that if we, if we do that. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, I we have a motion and a seconded motion. And I'm going to call a roll and this is a uh, Christina Gentry. I would approve. I would also approve that we would look at this and examine this during our retreat. Um, I just wanted a little bit more time to come familiar with some of the planning commission's uh, um, objectives. Right. Okay. Uh, Rebecca Buford. Approve. Dana Ortiz. Approve. Edith Guffey, not here. Thomas Howe. Approve. Ron Gacious. Approve. Erica Zimmerman. Approve. Sarah Waters. Approve. Thomas Allen. Approve. Monty Soka. Approve. That's 9-0. So this will definitely be on our agenda. And I don't know if, uh, Leah, we should probably figure out how to get some information out to people to review before the uh, before the uh, retreat so we people can be you know prepared to have rich discussion uh, at the point we have the retreat. Uh, I know it puts a lot on your uh, shoulders, but um, we'll work on that. So. Okay. Thank you, Ron, for bringing that up. Um, any other new business that we need to deal with today? All right, seeing none, there are a couple uh, calendar updates. Uh, March 14th, we're gonna deal with the home allocations. Um, on April 11th, meeting, we're gonna talk about uh, community affordable housing goals, and we're gonna do a little bit more retreat planning. 
and then uh, in May we'll have our retreat. So with those things, I would, unless somebody else has a comment to add, Dana. I have a question, Dana Ortiz, Family mm -hmm. Promise of Lawrence. I have a question for Leah, please. I, at some point, I recall seeing that we were going to get an update from Corporation of How, uh, Supportive Housing, but but I don't see it listed now. Is that has that fallen off the off the this needs? Is this is Leah Roseland, Affordable Housing Administrator. It is scheduled for March. March. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Dana. Any other comments, concerns? I would accept a motion to adjourn. Ron, so Mr. moved. Chairman, uh, Ron Gish, okay. Chamber Representative. I move we adjourn. Thank you, Ron. Thomas Howe, Board of Realtors Representative. I would second that motion. Okay. Any discussion? All right, seeing that, I'll call the roll. Christina Gentry. I approve. Rebecca Buford. Approve. Dana Ortiz. Approve. Thomas Howe. Yes. Ron Gacious. Approve. Thank you all for your support. Erica Zimmerman. Erica, there you go. Approve. <laughs> Sarah Waters. Approve. Thomas Allen. Approve. Monty Soka. Approve. We not, motion passes 9-0. We are adjourned. Thank you for the discussion today. Appreciate the passion everybody has for this. Thanks. Thank you all. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>